it's always been interesting in my life to take a look at the things that I've gone through in my life and to evaluate what I've learned from my life. You see, that's kind of what God tells us to do when we look at the Old Testament. He says, take a look at the lives of these men and women of God or these people that I choose to use as an example for your faith to learn something from them. And it may not be learning what you think you ought to learn, but according to how the Holy Spirit applies it to your life, it may be just what God wants to inspire you with, to learn from different people's lives that were in the Old Testament. It didn't mean that they were perfect. Oh, far be it that they should be men and women of God that were perfect in the sight of God Almighty. Otherwise, why would they need Him? But rather, these were people who needed God who quite frankly lived according to what we call the faith that we've been given, the measure of faith that God has given to every man for salvation as well as for relationship in and knowledge of him. And so I find it interesting that in my life, when I was in ministry, when I first started out, you know, when I first got saved, I would get involved in ministry. You know, different ministries like the Calvary Chapel, Cape Lending Library, and I would watch leaders, you know, people that were in charge. I would see how they did things, how they operated, what was their relationship, you know, to how they made decisions and what they did in order to accomplish the purpose that they set out to. And I remember that one of the initial people that started, you know, some of the early tape lending libraries had to leave because of conflicts that they had, you know, personal conflicts. And I was always interested in that because I learned gradually that it wasn't really the leader that was in charge, but God behind the scenes doing things and pulling strings, so to speak. And so I kind of like was interested in that. So I, I got involved in all different kinds of ministries at the time back at Big Calvary. You know, like college and career, and I saw how that was going, and, you know, believers meetings, and, you know, I'd go over to, you know, the Wednesday night study. I went to the early home Bible study pastor's classes, you know, and kind of went to all kinds of things and got involved, but I always got involved behind the scenes. I always did things like set up chairs or go do what somebody asked them to do, or if they mentioned something needed to be done, I'd go do it. You know, kind of like what Romaine used to say about cleaning the toilets. Well, those toilets don't get cleaned automatically, trust me. <laughs> but the point was, was that any time that something needed to be done, I just figured that everybody else had the same thought I did. Well, I should go do it. I learned later on that wasn't necessarily true, but what I was learning in ministry at the time was in 20 years I spent never being involved in the front of ministry, but being behind the scenes in ministry. But I learned something interesting about leadership was that most of the time those that were in charge hadn't a clue what was going on. Almost every single incident and every single occasion that I ever saw, once you got down to the nitty gritty. Once you really got to the brass tacks of where people live at, you know, kind of like every day, like we're talking, really, it's not what you think. Most people are buffaloing their way through based on faith, as opposed to actually sitting down and practically doing things that look so smooth on the surface, but underneath are some terrified people going, oh no, what if I fail? And sometimes they did fail, but sometimes God only allowed it to happened for a season. And so I watched, as it were, different ministries, different ministers, different people, different pastors, different teachers, different elders, different all kinds of people doing this walk of faith, so to speak, you know. They do the walk. They do the walk of life. You know, and they walk along according to the knowledge that they have at the time. What little wisdom they've got, believe me, was accumulated gradually by a lot of false starts sometimes, or a lot of stumbling and fumblings and grumblings. And it takes them sometimes, some time before they kind of get it together. And then when you think that somebody's really got it together, you kind of learn that, you know, there's still some areas that they're still working on. And that's when I finally learned about men and women of God in ministry. Leadership is not about leading so much as being led. Because you see, if God is leading, then really the person you think is in charge really isn't. I mean, he's just kind of like 
the front man for God. He's kind of putting on a happy face for you, so that way you know you could kind of like see something, point at something, and blame someone. Because the real person in charge has always been Jesus. Jesus is walking in the midst of his churches. Jesus is in every ministry. Jesus can accomplish to shut down a ministry or to let a ministry go. Because he said something when he was walking on earth that was fascinating to me that I find very interesting, especially when it comes to people criticizing each other's ministry or pointing fingers at each other. He said to his disciples when they were getting ready to shut John down, he said, you know what, Jesus? That John over there, you know, John the Baptist, you know, he's over there making disciples. He ain't praying like we're praying. He ain't doing it the way we're doing it. We, we need to go over there and tell him to stop doing what he's doing because his disciples, you know, they're, they're interrupting our ministry. Jesus made an interesting statement. He says, don't. What? But, but Lord, they're not doing it our way. They're not doing it what we want them to do. They're not with us, so they must be against us. Don't stop them. No man can receive what he has except that it be given to him of the Father, Jesus said. Interesting. No man can receive what they have except it be given to them of the Father. But Lord, what about these Joel Osteens? What about Rick Warrens? What about Greg Lawrence? What about Billy Grahams? What about all these guys that are all different and they don't do the same thing? What about Benny Hinn's? What about Word of Faith? What about weird stuff? No man can receive what he has been given except it come from my Father in heaven. And at the end of the age, God will judge. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying accept all these people as being, oh, anointed or appointed, or chosen. Because, you see, many are called, and we're all called to be missionaries, but few are chosen. Few really have this anointing that their ministry may continue on, but a lot of people will be ministers while they're going through a learning process. I dealt with a lot of pastors, musicians, worship leaders, and people that, frankly, fleshed out pretty regularly. I've seen them blow it. You know, and they were in no uncertain terms really wrong, and yet God still used them anyways. I mean, I've seen lots of ministries and ministers, like even PTL Club with Jim Baker, were mega ministry, huge, what some of the biggest things that ever happened in Christianity fall. And yet, hey, did everybody that was involved at that time not be saved? I think so. You know, I think they're still saved. Quite a few fruits of that ministry are still around today. Though God did judge them. Because the scriptures tell us that God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that also shall he reap. So the reality of being judged will happen to each minister and ministry according to the Lord of that ministry, which is Jesus. But we are called to make that example of criticizing and being critical of each other to the point where we stop God from developing maybe a minister into what he wants him to be. I've been reading about different men of God who, you know, like I think it was Swindoll or somebody like that who didn't believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit. And then he wrote a book called Closer to the Flame and said, oops, I boo-booed all those years I was in ministry. And he was big. I made a mistake. Yes, there is a Holy Spirit. Wow! Novel. And yet, his own people that were following him, huge numbers, thousands, millions. And then one day, he suddenly said, you know what? There is gifts of the Spirit. Wow! Wake up, folks. It's not about following people, but what God is doing in a learning curve sometimes with people. And that's what I learned about in ministry. You see, I never found, boy, did it drive me nuts when I was younger. I never found a perfect pastor, ever. I don't care if it's Chuck Smith, Greg Glory, or, you know, <laughs> Rick Warren, or, or, uh, I'm trying to think of somebody that, you know, I can think of that I can pick on. But, um, anyways, none of them, if anything, I found all of them had faults. All of them had a little bit of blindside in some areas, maybe, you know, or maybe not blindside, but weaknesses in some areas of ministry, you know. Some of them were better at some point or some part of ministry, 
you know, and they were good for that, although they may have thought they were good at something else. And I used to have a lot of pastors that thought they were like, because they could sing, they should be a teacher. <laughs> well, some musicians are better at being musicians than they are at being pastors. Let that be a lesson to some of you. Some of them are better at being pastors than they are being musicians. Let that also be a lesson to you. Some of them can cross over a little bit, but not really, you know, 100% in each area. I haven't quite found that, you know, although people like to pretend they're David. <laughs> a lot of musicians really think that they know what they're doing, and <laughs> quite frankly, I warn you, be careful, you know. Musicians are still musicians, <laughs> even in worship, you know, and quite frankly, you know, that adoration from the admiration of all the people that are worshiping uh, sometimes gets to musicians too. Kaboom. But the reality of God taking these men of God and making them from clay into who he wants them to be was always such that in the Old Testament we always saw their inner workings. We always saw them make a mistake, fail, make some bad decision. Today, unfortunately, we don't allow for that much in grace that we give to other people. We tend to watch and look for faults to make them stumble, to cause them to fumble, to cause them to lose their way. And that's the hardest thing I know because I've been there where I can see where somebody is failing and I'm like, God, you do something or I will. And I conquered that finally recently, just just recently. I mean, it was like, man, the last hurdle was just this man of God that I knew that really, even to this day, I'm sure is still, you know, if he teaches, drives me crazy because it's like so off the wall that, man, anybody that knows their Bible knows better. <laughs> But he's a great evangelist in some ways, you know. He's wonderful in worship. I mean, he's probably one of the best anointed worship leaders I've seen in a long time, in some ways. But I've also seen the failings, you know, and kind of like the places where he's chosen not to grow, you know, and probably never will, sadly. But when I was working in that ministry with him, it was like such a challenge that, man, it put me right to the ground in crying out day and night and fasting and weeping and praying and even throwing dirt in the air and just crucifying my flesh. I mean, it was tough on me. My wife just was amazed that I would go through such agony of soul because I did not want to let any of sin enter into my life to cause conflict between him and I. And to this day, I have no idea what he may think, but I know where I'm at as far as my heart is concerned. Perfect. And I walked away from that perfect before the Lord. But it took 20 years of watching other ministers and ministries and people and realizing that nobody's perfect. Now the funny thing is is that at the same time I went out into business, you know. While I was in ministry, I was always working at some job somewhere, you know. Sometimes I was, you know, disabled and sick and you know, my disease caused me to be on social security and then I had to get off it. But at different times in my life I worked in different jobs where I I went to work, you know, and as long as my health held up, I stayed in those jobs, or sometimes God moved me on. But I've had jobs in all kinds of professional environments, you know, from working for millionaires, you know, that, you know, I was their administrative assistant, to working as a journeyman boiler maker where you're out sweating in the hot sun, 100 degree weather, you know, and you're working with welders and, you know, just getting power plants going, you know, and suffering and, you know, working 12 hour days, you know, and just, man, you know, dying in the heat. I worked in, you know, the cold extremes of northern Alaska where, you know, I was a Class A CDL truck driver, you know, and I was using fuel trucks, you know, and fueling up jets, you know, in remote areas, you know. Worked as a uh, safety checkpoint, one of the last checkpoints on the uh, Iditarod Trail before you get to Nome. You know, I was uh, all by myself, you know, keeping the power plants going and keeping the building going and keeping... No one around, but you know what? You know, because if you broke down, guess what? You died. No, you could call for help, but you know, you better hope so. It's dangerous up there. But the point being is that all these things, I found that no matter what I got into, whether it was corporate or personal finance, individual ministers or, or individual uh, wealthy people, or whether it's corporate, most people that I worked for didn't know what they were doing. They hired me to solve their problems, and. Oftentimes I did, because I was a tough, hard worker. I would go in and just work it till I could work it out. And I would just work hard, fast, quick, and just solve it. Get it done, get it over with, get on with it. 
And they liked that because it was a kind of like take charge attitude, go for it and just keep going. But I discovered that's what a lot of times leaders do. There's always someone else behind the scenes that's working and doing and accomplishing often more than you realize. I always tell people, and I tell my wife this now, that in business, it's not about who's in charge. It's about what he does with those he has, not what he thinks he knows. Because usually you'll find when you get into corporate or you get into business, it's the secretaries that run the business. I mean, that's the expression, is that it's the worker bees, so to speak, that really work, and the queen bee just sits around kind of like telling everybody what to do. <laughs> sort of, you know, but she doesn't really know what's going on. And that's kind of the point about sometimes in ministries, sometimes in life, sometimes in business. You may think that you got fired for one reason or some point in time you may have got let go because some corporate thing happened or you think it's political or you think it's social or you think some weird thing's going on. But behind the scenes of everything, believe it or not, God's in control. God inspired me that when I finally stepped out in ministry of my own, that I would stand before God and give an accounting that it's my ministry, you know, in other words, not mine so much as I own it, but mine so much as I'm accountable and responsible for it. When I continued on in the things that I'd always been doing on the side, you know, with ministry, that God finally said, now I want you, you, to step forward. I want you to step up. I want you to step out. I want you to take the reins, so to speak, and, and do it. And you know, I worked with a few people along the way for a short period of time and found, what a mess. <laughs> Sometimes it's easier to do it yourself. And I learned that learning curves, though I could do all of these things by myself much faster and a lot easier, when I first met my wife, I helped her to get jobs and I helped her to develop parts of her areas of education and development that she was lacking in in order to move up in her careers and her jobs so that she would have a better job or a better career. And I found that learning curves doesn't mean just because you can do it better that you should. Sometimes you have to step back, step away, watch and see and let people make their own mistakes. And most men learn that pretty fast with wives, you know, when wives are helping them or wives learn this pretty fast when men are, you know, like trying to tell you where to go and they don't read a map. <laughs> it's the old joke. But the point is is that in cooperation of the learning curve, sometimes it's a matter of letting people make a mistake so that they can learn from God in the way that God has chosen them to go. And sometimes you have to let go and let God. You have to learn that, hey, it's not about being perfect. It's about discovering grace. Because I found in my life that most people in life and in religion and in faith and in relationship with Jesus don't know what they're doing. But you know what? God has given us a word that says He doesn't want us to know what we're doing. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not in your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct your path. It also says that if any man knows anything at all, if any man thinks he knows anything, he knows nothing at all. In other words, there's a realization that you should become so wise that you know you don't have the knowledge that you need in order to make the right decisions. So you go to the source of all inspiration. You go to the source of all wisdom and all knowledge of what's going to happen tomorrow, what's going to happen or has already happened yesterday. And to him it's still the same, yesterday, today, and forever. And that's God. And that's what Jesus did. He committed himself to he who is able to keep him from falling. He committed himself to he who was his father, who already knew what he wanted done, and Jesus was told what to do. So you see, there is an authority, but our responsibility is to find out what God wants us to do, not what we think we ought to do. And that's where leadership has to find itself at some point in time, helpless. Because the more that a leader finds himself helpless and his hope is in the Lord, the more that a leader makes his decisions based upon what God says as opposed to what he thinks, then the realization of those around him is that, wow, look at that man's life. He just came back from talking to God. What will God say? 
Because then they're not pointing their fingers at the person of the leader, but they're realizing that God has spoken to that person. And whatever it is that the results are, are up to God and that person to lead them. And that's what happened to Moses at some point in time. The people began to realize, hey, you know, this isn't Moses' thing. We're blaming him, but at some point in time they had to finally decide, wow, God is with him. God has backed him up. And when Moses came down off the mountain, little did they realize that Moses had saved every soul that had come out of Egypt because he had interceded for them. But when God judged the children of Israel for rebelling against him and his servant, God backed Moses up every time, even though Moses at one time misrepresented God and had to suffer the consequences. You'll find that happening in the world today. There are people that misrepresent God. There are people that misrepresent Jesus in some way. They will be judged accordingly. But that's not for us to do or to say. Rather, it is for us to go the way that God has shown and teaching us to go. Because He wants to reveal to us His nature. He wants to inspire us with His, not just His will, but His heart. He wants us to have, as it were, that little you know symbol that everybody makes, you know, the little heart thing, you know, where they take their fingers and they go, oh, it's a heart, you know. Okay, fine. <laughs> I think a heart has more vowels, but anyways, just kidding. Just kidding. But the point is, is that God wants to reveal His heart to us, which is of peace and an expected end, of love that He so loved the world, and of joy unspeakable that we would not have any fear, but we would come to Him always to be held dear by the one that knows us better than we know ourselves and that has the future in store for us. And that's our Father. And so, you learn in leadership to not make many decisions on your own. You learn rather to make yourself totally, completely, absolutely committed to letting God decide and choosing to follow Him. Because if you do anything else other than that, you're really going to fail. Because in some ways, you're going to hit a wall that really is God's hands. And God just says, hey, stop for a minute. I want to talk to you. You got a fist. I want to take that fist apart. And I want you to open up your hands. Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to discipline you. But I'm also going to teach you how to love one another. Because that's what God wants us to do. Love one another as I have loved you. By this shall the world know you are my disciples indeed, and that you have love for one another. Don't doubt that leadership is in charge, as Jesus said. Don't doubt that the Father has given them a measure of faith to operate according to what He's told them to do. But don't doubt also that, though it may not be for you, you need to do what God tells you to do and not look at other people. 